sometimes you got to go back to go forward. Sometimes you have to go back to go forward. Uh, as Al mentioned, my name is Pastor John. I'm the student pastor and Families of Faith in Shannon. I also teach Bible for junior high and high school boys. <clears throat> and as he mentioned also, I'm Pastor Randy's um, successor. And as Al also mentioned, last week, Pastor Randy, in his message, said, sometimes you'll find yourself in a position where if God doesn't show up, you fail. Pastor <laughs> yeah. Randy called me about 11 this morning and said, hey, how would you like to preach tonight? <laughs> I said, well, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to say? Like, what, what, what should I say? And he's like, well, I'm there talking about vision, so talk about vision. Have anything in a vision? <laughs> so, well, what do you want me to say? Again, I said, what to say? I said, you know what? Don't tell me what to say. I want God to tell me what to say. Amen. Amen. Okay? Amen. We hung up. I said, God, what do you want me to say? And sometimes, sometimes you have to go back to go forward. Okay, you want a word on vision? You want a word on looking into the future? You want a word, a word on moving forward? Sometimes you got to go back. To go forward. That's the word I have for you tonight. Thank you for writing it down. Sometimes you have to go back to go forward. Sometimes you have to go back to go forward. I want to take you to Joshua 3 and 4. Joshua chapter 3 and 4. And I just want to lay some, some foundation for you. What's going on right now in Joshua 3 and Joshua 4 is Moses is dead. Okay, so Israel's leader, the only real leader they've known um, through, through the exodus of, of Egypt and the wilderness is, is Moses. He's gone. He's dead. Uh, you can say there's almost a, well, there is a transition. There's a change in leadership. Joshua is now the leader. And they're getting closer and closer to the promised land, and they come upon the Jordan River. And at this time, the Jordan River is flooded. So what used to be only 100 feet in width is now a mile, okay? So this is a situation where if God doesn't show up, we're going to fail. Now let me read to you Joshua 3, verses 7 through, through 17, okay? Verses, uh, Joshua 3, verses 7 through 17, this is how it reads. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore take twelve men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out before their tents, or <clears throat> excuse me, for when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests, bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped into the brink of the water. Now the water, now the Jordan was overflowed in its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far, far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan. And those flowing down toward the sea of Arabah, the salt sea, were completely cut off, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished 
passing over the Jordan. Let me just recap. <clears throat> the, the Moses is dead. Joshua is leading these people. They come up on the Jordan. The Jordan River is flooded. <clears throat> it's a mile in width now. And God says, listen, don't worry. Take these, <clears throat> take these people, these, these priests from the Levites, carry the Ark of the Covenant. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant, the people carrying it, their feet touch, the waters are going to part. You're going to walk through. So Joshua says, hey, gather up. This is what God says. And guess what happened? What God said happened. Okay? What God said happened. But that's not where we get the word from. Here comes, here's, here's where you got to go back to go forward. Moving on in Joshua 4. Joshua 4, verses 1 through 7. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest here stood firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan, and take up each with you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask, in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Church, school, fellow Christians, sometimes you got to go back to go forward. As we move forward as a church and leadership transition and things change and you move from opening a school, there's going to be some things that you're going to come up against, some trials, some suffering, some pushbacks, some hindrances, and you're going to have to go back to the word that you received 40 years ago. When God told you to build on the Northland, right? you're going to have to go back to the praying and the fasting and the Ecclesiastes affirmation that you got. You're going to have to go back to when you knew God spoke, God revealed himself to go forward. Amen. You're going to have to go back to go forward. You're going to have to go back to go forward because doubts will come, circumstances will come, feelings will come, naysayers will come, and you have to go back. You have to look back to those memorial stones when you knew God spoke, when you knew God affirmed, when you absolutely knew God was in this, to go forward. Amen. That's your word for vision. That's, that's what I have for you as far as your, your vision word in the series of Pastor Randy that he's teaching, okay? As you, as you, as you lay vision, as you look forward, sometimes you've got to go back to go forward. I grew up as a Catholic and so I grew up knowing about God but not knowing God. Like, I knew him up here, but I didn't know him here. And I was like a super Catholic. So, I mean, like, Catholic grammar school, all boys, Catholic high school. I was an altar boy. So I was like, I was like a real Catholic. <laughs> and, um, you know, graduated high school and fresh out of high school, um, my uncle got me a job as a union laborer, so I was making a real, real lot of money right out of high school. More money than anyone right out of high school should be making at that time. And like any smart person um, making that much money, I blew it all on, on anything that I could blow it on. Um, so I had a really nice car with spinning wheels and a sound system and TV and the dashboard and spent all my money on, on alcohol and drugs and parties and living the life, right? Everything that this world uh, says that you need to have in order to be fulfilled and content, I had it. I was living it. And um, realized around the age of 20-something that uh, this job as a union labor wasn't cutting in every once in a while. I would get laid off and there would be no income and there's just no way that I could continue to live um, off of unemployment if I wanted to be an adult. So... I set out to uh, become a police officer. Um, I, I took online courses and for two years uh, got my bachelor's degree in criminal justice. 
uh, started testing with a bunch of different police departments, and then hired. I was hired by the village of Schaumburg. I was a Schaumburg police officer. Um, got hired in 2007, and uh, I was very good at, at what I did. In fact, I was so good as a uniformed police officer that within five years, I was promoted to undercover police officer. And so now you take the lifestyle I was living with all the money and the drugs and the sex and the popularity and the fame, and then you add to it power, authority, fear, respect. So when I thought I had everything the world had to offer, and I did, now I had even more of it because I, had, I didn't realize there was this level. And um, never had to... Never had to pay for a drink in a bar, never had to wait in line to get into a club. I could walk in the back and, you know, the, the bartenders would just cover my tabs and, you know, my, my cell phone increased with the amount of female friends that I had. And I don't say that to boast, I say that to show you how much of the world I had. And in 2013, I was arrested by the DEA the FBI, several other police agencies, and what I was accused of, along with two of my other partners, was stealing drugs from drug dealers and then using informants to sell those drugs and make money for us. Um, it's a very big case. It was all over the internet, all in the news. Um, it was national because I was made aware from family that we have in Arizona and Florida, that it was in their papers and their news, and um, so I go from being on top of the world, having everything, to being in a 6x10 jail cell, solitary confinement, because I couldn't mingle around with the other prisoners, because they would kill me. I was a cop in prison, lost everything, money, um, benefits, my home in foreclosure, my bank account seized, um, uh, no longer had a... a Retirement benefits, health benefits, no longer a police officer, no more friends or girlfriends, and all over the internet the news slandered as this dirty, corrupt cop sitting in a jail cell, still very much not needing God. Still very much not needing God, okay? Um, if I wanted to, uh, I was in there for a 21 days total. Uh, my bond was set at $750,000 full cash. $750,000 full cash in order for me to get out. Uh, I took two showers because I was in this solitary confinement cell. If I wanted to eat, they would wheel food, food to my door. If I wanted to make a phone call, they'd wheel a phone to my door. I was in this cell all alone by myself. No one to talk to, no books to read, no TV to watch, no nothing, just me in a cell. And it wasn't until the 17th day, 17th day in solitary confinement that I said, God, I don't want to live this life no more. I, I understand. I see it now. It's like God opened my eyes and I got to see my life or what it really was. And I was like, God, I, I don't want to live this life. I, I realize that I'm in this cell, not only because of what I'm accused of, but for a bigger purpose. God, I, I don't want to live this life right now. I don't want to live this life anymore. I want to live for you. It's the moment, January 31st, 2013, I wholeheartedly repented. And it was in that moment that I confessed my sin and I repented that I physically felt this presence um, come into me. It started at my head and it, and it went down to my feet. It was like this warm syrup being poured over my head. And in that moment, something spoke to me, not audibly to where I heard it, but it spoke to me in my inner being to where I knew that it was really said, this is the Holy Spirit. Everything's going to be okay. Now, as a Catholic, I had no idea what was going on because they don't teach this in Catholicism, right? So I'm very much in the moment as this is happening. I'm like, what's happening? I have no idea what's going on. And that's the day I was saved. That's the day I, 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 I wholeheartedly repented and, and the Holy Spirit came into me and I, and I became a member of, of, of God's family. That's the day that everything that, that is in this book and, and everything that is, is taught and preached became alive within me. If you're here for the first time, in, 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 you came to hear Pastor Randy, I'll tell you this, there's no such thing as a coincidence. 
There's no such thing as an accident. I believe that I am here with this word, with this testimony, because God wants to speak to you. Perhaps you came in here with this sort of view of God, of, hey, he's kind of far off, not really real. And I don't really know about these church people, the hallelujahs, the songs. It's kind of weird, let me tell you. It might be weird uh, to you, but it's very real. It is, it is very, God is real, and I'm going to tell you, I, I, I'm living proof of that, and, and, and I'm going to show you how this word uh, is, is very, very relevant. Because uh, five days after I got saved, I got out of jail, but that didn't mean, just because I got saved doesn't remove me from these circumstances. I was very much facing a minimum of 24 years. A minimum of 24 years. I was charged with over 15 counts. Okay? So, so what? I got saved. You still face the prison. And it wasn't until um, October, October 2013, that my lawyer sits me down and my lawyer says, hey, what do you want to do with this? What do you want to, what do, you want to do with this? You know, you want, to, you, want to, you want to take a deal? They're offering you 18 years. Do you want to take a deal or do you want to fight this till the end? And I said, I don't know. We pray about this, right? And I pray. I had to go back to go forward. Amen. I had to go back to that jail cell and say, God, I know you're real. God, I know you saved me. I know that moment I wholeheartedly repented and you came into my life. And I know everything that you've done thus far. I'm going back because i got to go forward. God, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I'm reminding my memory. I'm reminding my memory of who God is is, who God was, who God's been, who he's revealed himself to, right? Because I'm in a situation where if you don't show up, Amen. I'm, I'm going to fail. October 2013. And I remember the day so clear. I, I woke up and, and I pushed play on the radio and the very first words that come out of the radio was stay in the fight till the final round. You're not going under because God is holding you right now. It's a Mandisa song. It's Overcomer. And at the time, it was played out. I hated it because they just played it so much. They played it so much. And so when it came out, I'm like, oh, yeah, Mandisa. Cool, whatever. And um, <clears throat> later on that same day, I go to church, and I, I go to the office to send out some emails. And, and I sit down, and I push play, and Caleb, and the very first words, very first words to come out on the radio, stay in the fight till the final round. You're not going under God is holding you right now. So now I'm like, whoa, hey, cool. Same words. It's kind of weird, but again, it's my days they play this song so much, whatever. Later on the same night, I'm sitting on my couch and I'm like, man, it would be cool if I went upstairs and I turned on the radio and those words came out. I'm like, that's never going to happen. No, it would be cool if it did. I bet it would. No, I bet it's not. And so I argue with myself for like five, five to ten minutes. And I go upstairs and I'm looking at the radio. I'm like, there's no way. Let's see. Stay in the fight till the final round. You're not going under. God is holding you right now. Wow. Which translates to, in my lawyer's words, stay in the fight. Go to trial. You're not going to prison. I got you. Amen. That, that, that was God's promise. That was God's promise to me. That was, but, but no, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. This faith stuff, sometimes, most of the time, doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up what's in reality. God, you tell me I'm not going, but on paper, I'm done. I can sit across from a lawyer. I can sit across from a judge. I can go on the internet and Google search and read uh, articles and, and watch newscasters. It's very real. My own feelings, my own thoughts. That doesn't make sense. There's no way. If you don't show up, I'm going. But God said, I'm not going. And so we fast forward to February. We'll sit down with my lawyer, and, and he's like, hey, I, I know you said you wanted to go to trial. Uh, I'm going to need $17,000 more. And I'm like, cool, on top of the 20 he already gave you? Yeah, no problem. Here you go. No, I had no money. I had no money. Um, um, I had paid back everyone who had already contributed to getting me out we didn't pay the 750 fully. My bond got reduced to 25. So I had, I had paid everyone back my bond. I had paid the retainer fee. I had zero money, zero dollars in my bank account. And this guy needs 17 grand. And I had to go back to go forward. 
I had to go back and say, God, in October 2013, you said this. God, I, I know you said this because if I go back to January 31st, you saved me. God, you saved me. You, you, you restored me. You redeemed me. You're building me up. You, you spoke to me. And now here I am with this hindrance, with this obstacle, with these feelings, this doubt, this worry, this I can't go forward. I'm scared. And such was the case with the Israelites. If they go forward and cross the Jordan River, they're now walking by faith. They're no more going to get fed manna from heaven. They're no longer in the wilderness. They're not going to have to walk by faith. So it was a big thing. And, and, and that's when the memorial stones were set up. Because they say, hey, so you're walking by faith. You have to go back to go forward. So I went back and I said, God, you said this. According to who you are, according to your word, you, you, you kind of, you said it. You kind of have to provide. Because, I mean, it's, 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 this is what you're saying. Now, I didn't email no one. Didn't start a GoFundMe page, didn't call people, didn't say, hey, I need 17 grand, contribute to my, my get out of jail uh, fund. And tell no one nothing. Because if this was from God, I needed to know it was from God. And I needed to know He was going to provide. And if He didn't show up, I'm going to fail. And, and I knew enough of God at that time to think, man, I could get just a random check in the mail. Hey, God could make $100 bills fall from my, my ceiling. I was buying lottery tickets. I was like, yeah, this is the one right here. God, I was going to buy it. This is it. This is it. I went to a Blackhawks game. I bought a 50 50 raffle, and I watched the price go up, and I was like, this is 17 grand. This is it. I'm trying to bring this promise to pass on my own. I'm trying to bring, bring this promise to pass on my own. And, and I had a deadline. It was the end of April, and we got closer and closer, and I was getting squeezed, and I was like, this is not, God's not showing up. This isn't happening. And I had to keep going back. I had to keep going back. I didn't even, I didn't even go forward to move through this next day. Get up in the morning and get through the day. I had to go back. I had to keep going back to go forward. It was right around that time that this girl from church approached me, and she said, hey, um, I think God wants me to give you money. And I said, no, you don't. You're just emotional. Because I had just... <laughs> listen, you know, I, mean, I, I had just shared my testimony. I was just baptized, and I shared my testimony. And I was like, no, you're just emotional. You just want to help me. There's no way. It's 17 grand. I'm not letting no one just give me money. This needs to be from God. I want no human involvement whatsoever. Listen, God's going to make my own bills right over my ceiling. Get out of here. Go pray about it. That's what I told I said, go pray about it. Right? That's the Christian thing. Hey, just go pray about it. But this girl lingers around. She keeps approaching me. She's like, listen, I really believe God wants me to give you money. So I say, okay, let's pray. <clears throat> God, this girl thinks uh, you want her to give me money. Okay, so if you want her to give me money, then tell me, okay? Um, send me this particular Bible verse in the morning. And, and let me see this particular license plate at some time tomorrow. And I need to hear these song lyrics to this song at this time, right? I put God in this box. I threw out this fleece, right? Like Gideon, hey, I'll throw out my fleece if it's wet. I know it's you. If it's dry, I know it's all I got. Here's, this is 17 grand, right? It, it is funny right now, but this is $17,000. This is 20 plus years of my life, and this is a big deal. I need to know it's from God. God, if you don't show up, I'm going to fail. And the next morning, nothing happened. <laughs> and I was completely wrecked because God wasn't showing up. And I had heard wrong. Maybe I wasn't saved. Maybe God didn't speak. Maybe this was my emotions. Maybe this is just something that I wanted. Maybe this is what I was hoping for. And just at the perfect time, my friend who was on vacation, but had been home a week, just happened to come in the office uh, at that perfect time and said, listen, brother, God doesn't have to tell you anything. If he wants to bless you, you have to humble yourself and, and let him bless you. And I was like, oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I got back together with this girl, right? Still didn't know the amount of money. I was like, okay, God, this we pray. God, this girl thinks you want her to give me money, okay? I will humble myself and take it. I'll humble myself and take it. The very next day, everything I asked God to do, He did. The Bible verse that I asked Him to send, 
to my phone, he sent it. The song lyrics, the specific song at the specific time, I heard it. And within a week later, that girl wrote a check for $17,000. Amen. And I had come to learn that at the time, the girl, uh, when we first met, uh, she was, we were talking, getting to know each other, and she's like, yeah, I got three jobs. And I was like, dang, you like work. <laughs> and she's like, no, I like money. And I said, ooh, that's going to be an issue. You know, God's going to test you in that. So when this girl wrote the check for 17 grand, she's like, just so you know, I prayed and I asked God to test me. And I said, God, test me. See who I love more, you or money. I want to be involved in something big. So here God says, hey, get 17 grand for this gun. You barely know. So he's answering two prayers at once. But this girl did not give me money. This money was straight from God. Okay, But I would not have got it had I not gone back Amen. to go forward. Okay, so now here's your 17 grand. We're going to trial. Cool, right? Okay. No. Another plea offer comes later on in the later on in the year. Hey, now we're going to give you six. My two partners that I got arrested with were already serving 12 or 15 years. We're going to give you six. You should take it. Dang, I should. It's six. I had a family meeting. Family like take it. I should take this deal. Now let me go back. Let me go back. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to move forward one way or the other. I'm taking the deal or I'm not. Let me go back. Let me see what God said. Stay in the fight till the final round. You're not going under God as well. Stay in the fight. Go to trial. You're not going to prison. Okay? I want back. I'm going forward now. No, I can't take this deal. I can't take this deal. I go back to go forward. I wake up one night, right? My lawyer tells me, he's, he's pressing me, take this, take this. I'm, I'm, I'm shook, right? I'm shook. Because it's getting close now. It's getting close, right? And something, the Holy Spirit, uh, every morning I get a Bible verse sent to my phone because that's a good Christian thing to do, right? That's, that's, we just get Bible verses sent to our phone. That's a good thing to do. And something told me, the Holy Spirit provoked me after midnight, Check your Bible verse right now. No, I don't check my Bible verse until I wake up in the morning. No, check it now. Okay, Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man lays a snare, but those who trust in the Lord is safe. Now, I go and research this, this verse in every translation, every commentary, because I'm like, I think God's trying to speak to me. You ever get in those positions where you're just looking everywhere for God? Like, God, where are you going to say something? God, I'm, like, I'm watching preachers that are not biblical looking for a word from God because I just need God to say something. Right? Fear of man lays a snare, but those who trust in the Lord are safe. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what that means. I go to sleep. I get awoken out of a dead sleep with this same whisper in my head, not audible in my heart, in my in like it woke me up out of a sleep. The fear of man lays a snare, but those who trust in the Lord are safe. And I'm like, holy cow, twice in the same night. I think God's trying to speak to me. I think God's I think God's trying to speak to me, right? Uh, wake up same day. This is all in one day now. Now, I go to this Bible study every Thursday, and something, Holy Spirit, told me a week prior, hey, you need to be in uh, this Bible study on this week. Someone's going to have something for you. I'm like, okay. So I go to this Bible study, and in this pre preacher's message, he references Proverbs 29, 25. He says, the fear of man lays us in, but those who trust in the Lord are safe. I had to leave the Bible study, stand outside, and cry because God had spoken. Amen. And what God was saying is, listen, this, this deal is a trap. You fear man. The fear of man lays a snare. The fear of man is a trap. Trust in me and you'll be safe. Amen. Amen. I end up talking to this speaker because Proverbs 29, 25 is not something that's referenced in every sermon. I said, hey, uh, when, you know, God spoke to me through you, when did you put Proverbs 29, 25 in there? Last night? Put it in there last night. So God has spoke. Don't take no deal. Continue to push through on this. I'm, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to deliver you. Now time went on, right? Time went on. There were certain things that happened within court that, you know, certain decisions made where the judge ruled favorably on my behalf that the state appealed it to the appellate court and then they appealed the appellate court decision which favored me to the Supreme Court. So this case, my name has been all the way up to the Supreme Court. I don't say that to say, hey, look at me. Keep in mind. What I was charged with is not something to boast about, okay? I wasn't 
arrested for giving money to the poor and building homeless shelters. Okay, so all the way to the Supreme Court. Five years I was hung up in the court system, and here we go. It's the week of trial, and I am terrified. I'm terrified because everything that I've been hoping in and believing in and telling people is about to happen. So I had to go back to go forward. I had to go back. No, listen, God saved you. January 31st, God saved you. Listen, October 2013, God spoke to you. February 2014, God provided for you, right? Later on, October 2014, God, God guided you. He guided you away. Here we are, February 2018. Man, go back. Go back to go forward. Go back to go forward. Go back to go forward. February 11th, 2.11 p.m., my lawyer called me. And he said, the state is dropping all charges against you. Wow. Mm. Mm. wow. He said, can you believe this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been telling you this for years. I've been telling everyone this for years. And again, it was all over the news, all in the paper. No one knew why. Incredible situation was the Daily Herald title. And they couldn't figure out why it happened two days before trial. Trial was February 13th. I got the call February 11th. Two days before trial. No one knew. Why did they do this? I knew the whole time. I was like, listen, you're going to put out whatever you want to put out on why you did this. You did this because for reasons that are still beyond me, God in His divine sovereignty and His mercy and His love and His grace chose to, to deliver me. To deliver me. Amen. But had I not gone back to go forward, I wouldn't be standing here right now. And again, I want to go back before we go forward. If you're here, and, and, and you have this view of God as not really being personal, not really being loving, not really being intimate, not being able to have a relationship with you. Let me offer me another explanation for what happened to me and what happened in my life. Now, I'm not even talking about being delivered from the court case. Now, I'm talking about the transformation that has happened in my life. Amen. Okay, how do I go from being this dirty, corrupt, uh, uh, careless, prideful, arrogant man to, to what you see here right now. Amen. Why, how did I get here? And I also want to say, if I am here, not that I'm the end-all, be-all, savior of Christianity, leader of revival, no. But if I am here, but God really did deliver me from that, and you could really go and Google it, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for this church? What does that mean for this school that's going to start? Do you think God's going to deliver me, do all this stuff, and then say, okay, see ya. It's been nice getting to know you. Go ahead. Go just coast. No, I would say that if I'm here, not that I'm the end all, be all, savior, Christian, and leader of revival, but if I am here and God did do that, he's going to do something so amazingly huge within this church and within this church. And it's the same thing Pastor Randy, right? This guy started literally a thousand churches, you know, and, and he's an entrepreneur and a businessman, and he starts to, he's here. Not that he's the end all, be all leader of Christianity, revival guy, but if, if there's key figures like that within this, if he's here, listen, if this guy's here, if you're here, if you're here, if you're here, if you're here, everyone plays a part in this. Everyone has stories. Everyone is valuable. God is not going to bring us together and do all this work to say, okay, see ya. Oh, you know that word I gave you? Just kidding. No. No, that's not God. Everyone here is, I want you to be excited. Amen. Go back to go forward because there's going to come a time moving forward where things are like, I don't know. I don't know. This doesn't seem right. Or we don't have enough money. We don't have enough kids. We don't have enough staff. I don't like this person. Well, you don't like him either. <laughs> and you're going to have to go back to say, no, listen, God said this. 
God said this. You go back to go forward. You go back to go forward. Listen, wait, I don't even know, like, like, I'm going to take over for Pastor Randy. I say that humbly. What am I doing? Like, do you understand that? I, I am that, that dirty, corrupt cop guy that got delivered, and now I'm the successor for Pastor Randy, who has started Families of Faith and all these churches and all these schools. I'm sitting in his office, and I'm like, what, did, what am I doing here? How did I get here? Amen. Now, I know how I got here. You know how I know how I got here? I gotta go back. Come on, girl. Come on. Come on. Come on. I go back to go forward. That chills right there. That's it. I go back to go forward. And that's what gives me confidence. That's what gives me the courage, the boldness, the faith, the strength to move forward. And I go back and I look at, oh my gosh. Look at what you've done. You've been here, you've been here, you've been here. How could I not go forward? How could I not go forward? How could I just stand here? You've been so real. You've been so faithful. You've been so good. You've been so evident. How can you not walk through those school doors and say, yeah, he's not here. <laughs> yeah, he's not here. How can you not continue to push forward? How can you not continue? Why would you? Why would you? These Israelites, they didn't get halfway through the Jordan. That's part of now. They're like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. They didn't just stand here. They definitely didn't go back and stay back. For the generations to come, for these children that are here, you go back to go forward. You go back to go forward. If there's anyone here, and you're like, you come in here and you have this view of God that's not really personal, not relational, you're like, listen, I don't, I don't, I don't, have that, Pastor John. What you have, that intimacy, that I don't have that. As a matter of fact, I don't know what I have. If you want that, it's available to you. You can begin a relationship with God right now. Because the truth is this, God created us to be in a relationship with Him. But our own personal choices, we chose to disobey Him. And that disobedience brought about sin into the world, into our lives. And that sin leads to death, eternal separation from God. Eternal separation from God. And everyone sins. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. And God does not want that for us. That's not why he created us. So what he did is he sent his only son, his only son, Jesus Christ, who is fully God in the flesh. And this Jesus lived the perfect life, the life that God requires of us to live. He lived it. And he offered himself as a sacrifice, paying the wages for us. That death, he paid it for us. He was buried, he rose again on the third day, and right now, because of what Jesus did, God now offers you eternal life, right standing, righteousness, forever. All you have to do, if you're here and you don't have a relationship with God, you want one, is repent. Repent. It's a change in thinking that brings about a change in behavior. You change your thinking from thinking God is far off to God is very near. From I can't be made right to I can be made right in Christ. Amen. Maybe some of us have this works works based based religion, this Catholicism where you have to do and do and do and do and do and do what Jesus says done. Done. Maybe you have to repent of that religion and enter into a relationship. You repent and you trust in Jesus. He is who he says he is. Amen. He did what this what the Bible says he did. And right now is offering you right standing. Relationship. Listen, if you don't want to believe the Bible, if you want to believe a preacher, believe me. I just shared with you who I was, what God did. You're looking at evidence right now. You want proof that God is real? You want proof that a relationship with Him is real? Hi, my name's Pastor John. I'm the Associate Pastor of Families of Faith. I'm the successor of Pastor Randy. You can Google me. This stuff is real. God is very real. Teenagers, little kids, God is real. God is more real than what you scroll through on Instagram. I can go, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up because this is getting into a whole other message right now. <laughs> <laughs> go back to go forward. Go back to go forward. Not just for the vision of this church, not for the school, but for Christians in, in your own personal faith walks. You're going to go through some stuff. You're going to enter some, some waters that are like, hey, I've been through this, but this. I can't go through. Look back. Go back to go forward. It's the same God. Amen. It's the same God. Go back to go forward. Go back to go forward. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.
If you're here today, some things I've said piqued your curiosity. Perhaps you don't have a relationship with God and you want one. I want to put you in a position to be uncomfortable, but I'm going to stick around after. Come talk to me. Please come talk, talk to me. Let me pray with you. Let me pray for you. There's leaders here. There's pastors here that would love to, to speak more to you, help you grow and cultivate your relationship with God. If you're here and you're currently going through something right now, and it's bringing about fear, doubt, anxiety, depression even, perhaps some temptation to give in to the world to just satisfy self. Why don't you ask God right now? Ask God right now where you said, God, cause me to look back. Bring to my memory memories of those times in my life when you provided for me, when you guided me, when you spoke to me, that time during worship when tears were coming down my face because I knew you were with me, that time in prayer when I knew you were with me, that time when I knew you led me here, when you, you spoke to me here. God, bring back to my memory. God, cause me to go back so I can go forward. God, do that right now. Ask God to do that for you. God, I thank you for this word. I pray, and I know that it will not come back void. I pray that the, the word that you've given me, the, the testimony that you've given me, the things you've given me to say that go out, your Holy Spirit takes it and pierces the hearts of everyone here that can fix, convicts them and, and encourages them and conforms them and sanctifies them, that they leave here differently than when they came in. But they don't just leave here with the word here, they leave here transformed, different, with a, a, a more passion, a fervency, more faith and trust and more of a hunger to seek after you and, and, and who you are, God. Open their eyes so that they see you. In every single detail of their lives, God, every breath that we breathe, it's, it's you speaking to us. Every breath is grace, God, and we thank you for it, God. Open our ears that we hear you, our hearts that we comprehend and understand and follow you, God. Our, uh, give us to increase our faith and our strength that we boldly proclaim who you are, who you are to this next generation, God. As we go forward, as we go forward, we know you go with us. Help us to never forget that, God. And if we do, and we enter those uncharted waters where we need to see to be part of, where if you don't show up, we fail. Help us to go back, to go forward, because it's in going back. And we go forward. Everything we pray is in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.